Um, as Mark alluded to, I wanted to start off just by talking about uh, my varied research interests or my background. I started off working with Atlantic cod and fisheries on the East Coast in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and looking at responses of cod to environmental conditions through time and through space. So hence the spatial ecology um, statistics background. Moved on to looking at fish communities in coral reefs, trying to assess what ecological role reef sharks have in these communities, these very complex communities. I've now started to think about more of the planning side of conservation, so moved to more uh, marine planning with a uh, paper with a colleague of mine, Gabrielle Vienna in Palau, with, with sharks in marine protected areas. But then also with uh, caribou now with uh, Dave Martel um, and thinking about wood supply and caribou conservation. Um, and then finally, I had a short postdoc uh, at, York, at York University where I looked at the direct uh, effects of climate change on woodland caribou distribution through Ontario. Um, and we're looking to extend some of the work that I'm going to talk about today, which I'll, I'll talk about at the end of my presentation, uh, to look at that climate change angle with wood supply planning as well. So my collaborators uh, for this talk uh, include Dave Martel, chief among them, uh, who's happiest in a fire. Uh, you'll notice he's actually smoking a cigarette, I think, in the midst of that fire. Uh, but also Eldon, Eldon Gunn, uh, who's at the Dalhousie University at the Industrial uh, Engineering Faculty over there. Uh, Colin Daniel, who designed the state and transition models, which I'll talk about the landscape uh, simulation models that, that I, I will present in this uh, presentation. And then uh, Marisa Zay Fortan, who's at the Ecology Department at the University of Toronto. So just to give you a quick overview, I'm going to start by just introducing the topic, the conflict between wood supply and woodland caribou, uh, talk about the questions and a workflow uh, that I've, I've, I will apply to this problem, uh, which includes trying to assess a value of a stand of forest to caribou, then subsequently using those values to come up with a planning solution. And I'll walk through an example of using Mark Sand, which is a common conservation tool used in ecology. And then I'll talk about simulating that landscape out about 100 years using state and transition models and talk about some future directions. So woodland caribou, as most of you are probably aware, uh, are not doing so well. Uh, and that's down to a lot of different uh, cumulative threats across that landscape. But I like, I like maps, so I like to start off with just showing you the distribution of woodland caribou here in light brown. What you can, what you can clearly see is that they are not only endemic to Canada at this, this stage of the game, but also that you find them mostly in these boreal forest re uh, regions throughout Canada. The historical extent you can see down here in the dashed line in the late 18th century. So you can see there's been quite a large amount of range procession over the last century. And chief, the chief threats to caribou include most of those related to habitat alteration. So whether you're talking about timber harvest, fire, or habitat configuration, the increase in early successional forest is not good for caribou. It's very good for deer. It's very good for moose, which subsequently increases their predator populations, wolves and black bears in Ontario, which impacts caribou by increasing predation pressure on them. Alongside these habitat alterations, we also have poaching incidences, but also uh, road building, which is a big one uh, when we're talking about caribou. Roads have negative impacts on, on caribou by allowing predators to move across that landscape, but also you could have uh, problems with collisions with road traffic as well. What we know is that some regions where we have very good data show signs of population decline. Uh, so regions where we do have a lot of really good data on caribou, like Alberta, um, there's clear trends over the last decade that they're declining. There's also been a pretty severe range recession in Ontario. So we're talking about a range recession at their southern limit of 34 kilometers per decade moving northward. They were, they've been designated by COSIVIC, so the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada in 2002 as a threatened species. And a subsequent uh, follow-up of habitat assessment uh, by Environment Canada found that 70% of the variation in the recruitment is explained by a composite measure, which includes all of these habitat alterations So that, that I mentioned before, fire and those anthropogenic roads, um, timber harvest on the, on the landscape. So where we have this very good data, um, just to explain that a little bit and flush that out a little bit more, if we look at the total disturbance of, of the cumulative disturbance of those anthropogenic factors and fire, and their mean recruitment measured as calves per 100 cows, there's a clear linear trend, whereas if we, we increased 
total disturbance, we have this decline in recruitment occurring in caribou populations. This is a 95% confidence interval around that um, linear regression. So we think of that in the sense of population stability, where here we have probability of population stability uh, across an axis of total disturbance. What you can clearly see is that there's a point where that stability goes below 50%. So this is the reg critical region uh, which, which we have to think about for caribou, which is somewhere in the range of 35 to 45% of disturbance on our, on our landscapes for the range of a given population. What that translates to across Canada are various different impacts for different populations. And I'll put the caveat that we're very data poor on a lot of these populations. We actually don't know where some of these boundaries are between caribou, especially when we're talking about northern Ontario. Uh, but where we do have very good data, there's clear signs that they're not self-sustaining. So we can think of this as uh, red actually being not self-sustaining, moving to green where we're looking at a very good uh, self-sustaining population. And there's clear patterns where notably out in the prairie provinces, caribou seem to not be doing well. Um, but there are definitely uh, populations through Ontario that are facing the same sort of threats. So how does this impact wood supply? Well, when we're thinking about caribou conservation and we think about the range of caribou, I'm, I'm working specifically on Ontario, so I'm going to speak to Ontario more. But what we do see is that when we look at the range of caribou through northern Ontario, that it's these forest management units in the north where we seem to have this conflict. Now, caribou and wood supply a caribou habitat and wood supply are in conflict because they both prefer similar habitat types. So industry wants mature boreal forest because you want to increase the amount of volume you're getting off the land, but also caribou desire mature boreal forest as well, and I'll get into the reasons behind that uh, in, in a moment. But given their threatened status, um, caribou, there's, a, there's a requirement for caribou habitat, uh, for wood supply plans, sorry, to demonstrate minimal impact on wood, wood, woodland caribou habitat. In northern Ontario, or northwest Ontario specifically, uh, they've implemented something called the Caribou Mosaic Plan. This has been implemented for the last 15 years, uh, which is, I mean, built with uh, caribou in mind. So it's good for caribou in that what they're trying to do is rotate through these cutting blocks to maintain an overall amount of habitat across that landscape so that caribou can persist in the long term. Now, I'll go into the details of, of, of what that is in a, in a few moments. But one thing that this does not consider is economic feasibility of, let's say, harvesting particular stands up in the north where we'd actually have no roads to access that at the moment. But also, another big issue is that here we have this static plan. Uh, in reality, it's implemented in a dynamic way. That is, every 10 years, the landscape's reevaluated and these blocks are assigned across that landscape. Uh, but because it's such an intensive way and labor intensive based on objective and subjective means to create this plan, uh, what we can't do is create a plan every 10 years when we're trying to simulate out this wood supply through time. So there's really two things that need to be done. There needs to be a more dynamic way to assess the long-term impacts of these plans, but also there, there's a need to better integrate economics and conservation values in, in, into these wood supply plans as well. So the questions that I'll be talking about today, the first problem is how valuable is a given stand of forest to woodland caribou? Uh, we, we have a really good idea at figuring out how much volume is out there, how valuable that wood is, and how much it will cost to take it out, out, out from that forest. But we don't have a very good idea as to how valuable that, that stand, particular stand of forest is to a woodland caribou population. The second one is where do you allocate conservation and timber harvest zones in the planning cycle so that we're thinking about caribou constraints, what they can sustain across that landscape. And then the third one is to assess what those long-term impacts of that planning supply are by looking at harvest, fire, and succession across that landscape through time. So I work from this uh, conceptual workflow where first we're going to talk about classifying that landscape with respect to caribou preferences, then estimating the patch importance of the value of that patch by using graph theoretical approaches. Then moving to uh, selection and, uh, of conservation and harvest zones using that planning model. I'm going to run through an example using Marksan, which is a conservation model which is used by ecologists a fair bit. Uh, we're going to move towards something a little bit more complicated, Dave Martell and I, but at this point in time, this is, this is what we're, we're running with. 
And then I'm going to talk about those state and transition models and simulate out that landscape. So when we're talking about a value of a particular stand of forest to woodland caribou, uh, we're talking about preferable habitat where we find desired resources and or reduce predation pressure. With determining that patch importance, as I alluded to, uh, configuration and thinking about graph theoretical approaches uh, seems to be the way to go, given that caribou migrate and move around this landscape. So when we think about the boreal subspecies of caribou, they have defined wintering areas, calving areas, and summer grounds, where we can get movement, depending on the time of the year, between these distinct areas, uh, which can be on the order of 20 to 30 kilometers in Northwest Ontario, could be different depending where you are in the country, what sort of habitat you're dealing with. But in the region that we're interested in, the maximum sort of linear distance of dispersal for this migration route is about 50 kilometers um, per, per year. Calving areas uh, are the ones that stick out in that they can select these areas just based on reduced predation pressure. So here we're talking about little islands in the middle of lakes uh, where they might not be preyed on so much by things like wolves or, or black bears. So that's the one real habitat that's going to stick out that's going to be different from, from these other two. But there are subtle differences, obviously, between these different um, areas that we're talking about. So if I was a woodland caribou, uh, I would prefer mature boreal forest. So we're talking about forest that's 60 years of age older. Uh, this is canopy associated with lichen understory, which is a preferred resource. But also, because that is the preferred resource for caribou, it is not a preferred resource for deer and moose. Hence, they have reduced predation pressure in this type of habitat. And generally, what we're talking about in Northwest Ontario are contiguous stands that are predominantly a mix of black spruce and jack pine in the boreal forest. We're also talking about habitat that can have sparse canopy cover or barren rock, where we have a lot of lichen growing on it. But also, another preferred area would be hilly lowland areas alongside treed muskeg. They like these muskeg areas because it's hard for predators to move around in them, and also caribou. But they also have a preferred resource within the area. What we can pull upon are a lot of previous work that used telemetry um, as a means to determine how preferable a piece of habitat is for caribou. And so pulling upon compositional analysis or studies that, that look at how much time um, caribou actually spend in these different types of, of, of forest cover um, might be one means of, of going about sort of ranking or determining how preferable a piece of habitat is or how less preferable that piece of habitat is. And so here, Dan O'Brien et al. Uh, published a paper in biological conservation uh, for a Manitoban herd, which is great close to the northwest Ontario region that I'm going to be talking about. And what, what they were able to do was determine that caribou, as I alluded to, prefer that jack pine dominated sparsely treed rock, subsequently the treed muskeg, mature conifer upland, followed by mature conifer lowland, intermediate mixed wood upland, young conifers and hardwood were the least desirable followed by water and those recently burned or harvested areas. Roads would be somewhere down here, if we're thinking about roads on that scale of preference. So the case study region that I'm going to be talking about is the Trout Lake Forest. This is about a million hectares forest, uh, where we can find three different caribou populations um, using this area. Probably more like two. The third one doesn't seem to be using this, this area too much anymore. Uh, this is an area of active fire. Uh, forest management for wood supply, so it's, it's a good candidate um, to use within our, within our study. Pulling on forest resource inventory data, which is arguably, I mean, we could argue what is better a source of data for, for, for canopy cover, but here, readily available for us, um, and we can classify it into preferred caribou habitat. So when we're looking at these stands of forest and also the road networks through um, Trout Lake Forest region, what we can clearly see is that these dark blue areas where we have our most preferred habitat by caribou, whereas these red areas are the least preferred of these habitats. So we create this cost surface, as you will. So the higher the value, the more costly it is for caribou to move within that patch, or the less desirable it is for caribou to be within each of these patches. So now that we have our preferred um, caribou habitat, if we're thinking about movement between these preferred patches, which caribou do, uh, we could think about it in terms of Euclidean distance. So if we're moving between patch A to B, they could be straight as the crow flies. What is the minimum distance they have to travel to get between A and B? That's probably not realistic when we think about the intervening habitat. 
So when we think about in hot, hospitable habitat, let's just say recently burned forests or blowdowns, caribou probably don't want to be running through that. In all likelihood, they're using something what's called a least cost path. What's a least cost path? Well, it's the path between two locations that the cost that costs the least to traverse across that landscape, where the cost is a function of distance. So when we're looking at that cost surface, we know where our preferred caribou habitat patches are. We can then form these least cost paths between our, our, our habitat patches and get an idea of how expensive energy-wise it might be for caribou to travel, let's say, from this patch to that patch, or this patch to that patch. Based on these weights, we can then use any number of thousands of metrics that are out there. But what seems to be the best one, the hottest one that everyone wants to use these days is the equivalent connectivity area, which is based from the conifer package, if you're familiar with it, which here is Santiago Sora, um, which he published in Ecological Indicators, developed this metric where it looks at the sum of the area between all of our patches multiplied by the maximum product probability between these patches. What is the maximum product pro probability, you might want to know? Well, if you're going between patch A and B, your probability of dispersal between A and B could be something on the order of 20%. If we think about the intervening patches between these, these patches A and B, so think about patch C, that probability of dispersal might be 50% between A and C and 50% between C and B, thus giving you maximum product probability of 25%. So when we're saying maximum product probability, we're taking what is the maximum probability that we can get between two given patches. So we apply that to our cost surface and the links between our, our patches. We get a value um, that's distributed throughout our landscape where we have higher valuable patches down here in the southeastern region of Trout Lake Forest, um, less valuable up in this area in the northwest of Trout Lake Forest, although there are some patches you can see here that have, have higher values. So low value, sorry, I should have explained as dark green, high value going towards that, that red. Great, okay, so we have a value for a given stand of forest for caribou. This is caribou preference. This is a preferable habitat for caribou, and this is how much more valuable this preferable habitat might be versus other preferable pieces of patches. So, what is really interesting now is where can we cut the forest down such that we have a minimal impact on caribou but also meet the needs of industry throughout the region. Working through this workflow, we've classified that landscape, estimated the importance, so now we're, we're down here um, and I'm going to walk you through an example of, of, of Mark Sand. So when we're talking about wood supply at a national level through managed forests, uh, we can talk about things like the annual allowable cut, which is never fully achieved by industry. And the chief one that seems to come up, the chief reason for that, seems to be economic values, which are often not fully accounted for in, in the AC. So when we're looking at total potential wood supply through our managed forests in Canada, um, it's this blue line here, of wood volume a million cubic meters, what we're actually harvesting is something more like this, this, this green line through time. Um, so one thing when we're thinking about uh, conservation planning is either you can minimize the cost to uh, industry or you can maximize the amount of, of wood volume. Here I'm going to talk about minimizing the cost of offsetting certain parcels of land to conservation and not making them available to, to industry. So I promised you I would walk you through this plan. It's currently in place for the Trout Lake region. This is the Caribou Mosaic Plan for Trout Lake Forest. This considers a, a mixture of different sets of values and impacts to caribou. Chief among them, roads, future wood supply, but also caribou habitat assessment. So using their calving areas as, as a, um, a place of interest, but wintering grounds, summer grounds, et cetera, et cetera. And so based on those subjective and objective means, what, what has been done is we've allocated certain cut blocks for the first 20 years, others, in light blue here for the subsequent 20 years, between 20 and 40 years, then in this light pink, which is not really showing up very well, and then the subsequent next 20 years, and so on and so on, this gray area can be cut at any given time. And then we have these conservation zones, which are set up uh, throughout the FMU, which are never cut or harvest for um, wood supply. In practice, I said that this is a dynamic model. That is, if it 
wasn't so labor intensive, we could then use their classification scheme to then reevaluate the landscape every 10 years that you would expect a wood supply that to be created. Sorry, wood supply plan to be created. Uh, but because we don't have that classification, in fact, talking to the wood supply modelers at MNR, they don't even have that wood, uh, the classification scheme. Um, that, that's not, not a viable option for us to assess how that would play out through time. One of the chief criticisms that I have for, for this type, assessing wood supply in the long term for, for this plan is that because we're working from a static design, when you put stochastic processes such as fire across that landscape and you burn out a whole section of, of, of wood supply, um, that really dramatically impacts how these, these, the dynamics of the system works through time. So what I'm going to be showing you is Mark Sand. Mark Sand stands for marine and spec sand. So it obviously originated in a marine context, but can be used in terrestrial and marine systems. Spec sand is spatially explicit annealing. Um, what we essentially do is we use a grid which we can then define a conservation network based on either a network that exists or doesn't exist at all. In Trout Lake Forest, I showed you that there are some conservation zones which we can work from, and we want to extend those zones to incorporate those high valuable patches um, with, with, within our Trout Lake Forest management area. What Mark Sand does is it minimizes the cost uh, across that landscape for allocating conservation zones. So that is our unit costs, which is the cost of designating one of our grid cells as a reserve. So that could be a cost that's either area or economic, the amount of wood supply potential value of that stand. There's also a cost for how contiguous the design should be, that is, how compact it should be. So this parameter right here uh, ensures that we can get a more connected, more contiguous design rather than a more disparate patches all over the place in our, in our landscape. And then finally, there's a cost of not including a parcel in the reserve when a species is present, or in this case, when we have higher values of, of, of uh, ECA across our landscape. I should mention that the solution space for this is nonlinear, and so Mark San uses simulated annealing to find many near feasible solutions. That is, we'll have thousands of different solutions. But what we can do is we can look at the top 95% of those, so those that are selected 95% of the time or more, and what we find is that we have conservation areas designated here in blue and harvest areas designated here in yellow, um, which we then subsequently mirror that ECA value scheme and also our, our reserve network that we see through the Trout Lake Forest. So now, how do long-term impacts of timber harvest, fire, and succession affect woodland caribou? There are a lot of disturbances that occur in Canada's forests, um, and this is sort of just a summary slide of disturbances over the course of two th from the year 2000 to the year 2013. Chief among most of these disturbances are blowdowns, insect outbreaks, fire, but for caribou when we're thinking about it, it's also timber harvest. What we need to do is simulate those disturbances out through time. And one of those things that, that, that one of the things that Colin Daniel chiefly developed is something called the state and transition simulation model. So this is a spatially explicit Markov chain simulation model. What I mean by that is we have discrete states of, of our forest. So in this case, in the simple example, if we have a, the same type of forest, same species, just one species on our landscape, we can classify it into different stages, so early, mid, late. We then have deterministic transitions, so deterministic would be succession from early to mid, or succession between mid to late based on age of our stands of forest. But then we can also have transitions that are more stochastic, and that would be fire, so the probability of fire in each of our given stages of a forest, but also potentially you can add insect outbreaks there. We can also then say, well, we also want to harvest a given amount of our landscape um, based on a certain distribution of cut block sizes or a given cut block size, and we can implement harvest on a particular um, discrete state across that landscape as well. So essentially what we work with is multiple transition pathways between these states to also, when we're thinking about the succession, fire, insect, harvest models, uh, we can incorporate more complex things like the spread of fire, how it might um, spread throughout that landscape, um, to impact uh, disturbance uh, across our Trout Lake Forest region. So just to walk you through, just an example, just so that you 
have a basic understanding of what we're doing here. Um, if we have a simple landscape where we have our early, mid, and late stages, we can then initialize these states by attributing an age to all these discrete states. Um, we can then invoke our model and our transition. So first, the succession. We can see that at the age three, we move, let's say for instance on this early stage, we're moving between this early stage and mid stage. For fire, so the probability of fire in our different um, state classes, this is invoked by Bernoulli trials, so that is roll the dice, we can randomly allocate that across our landscape. The last one is harvest, so we're only harvesting our late stage, um, and this is by area as I alluded to, uh, where we can then uh, allocate that harvest uh, through time as well. So when we, when we implement these transitions, we then update the slide, and we can go through that on however many different sort of time intervals or length of time that we're, that we're interested in, in, in assessing that landscape. In terms of the nuts and bolts, I'm not going to get into too many details, but just to say with our succession model, we're working from the strategic forest management models, FUM, which is used by MNR, so that we have some sort of standardization when we're comparing their plan to, to our proposed plans. This involves different civil culture intensities, four different levels. Standard forest units, we're talking about 12 different types of forests. So you can already see how many discrete states we're working with. That's already 48, and then we have different age classes as well. So there's a, this is a, a web of a mess when we're talking about mapping out all these transitions, so I didn't expose all of you to that. But uh, we also have a fairly simplistic fire model in here. So here we're working with the probability of occurrence and size for our given study area, where we also implement a stochastic periodicity, so we don't have the same level of fire every year if it oscillates through time. But also we, we have suppression assumptions because this is the area of the undertaking where we um, have suppression, uh, Trout Lake Forest region uh, uh, has fire suppression activities uh, throughout the summer months. Our harvest model is also very simplistic in that we have a set, we use uh, the amount of forest in, in the, the forest management plans, so that is Domtar is the chief uh, company working in this area. We look at their plans, we look at what they're planning to cut, what they require um, to, to maintain uh, their quota and run, run their, their, their company essentially. <laughs> and uh, we look at the area of these, these, these uh, harvest cuts and we implement that in, in our given uh, harvest restriction area to our planning uh, model. So we look at four different scenarios. One where we have no harvest, so just fire and succession only. One with no harvest restrictions, so that is we cut everywhere except for where we have conservation zones. The third one is that caribou mosaic plan, and that fourth one is the, the Mark Sand solution that we're talking about. So the Mark Sand solution being that we can cut anywhere in this yellow area, but nowhere in this, this blue area. Sort of a quick assessment of how the landscape is faring for caribou through time would be to look at the amount of early successional forest. That is, forest which is less than 40 years in age. That is forest which is desirable by, by moose and deer, but less desirable by caribou. And what we can see through time with our four different scenarios, um, so the block being the caribou mosaic being this, this uh, red, the no harvest scenario being in the green, uh, mark sand being in the purple, and uh, where we're we don't have any harvest restrictions except for those conservation areas in the blue. Uh, when we look at the mean of our 100 different iterations that we ran in these scenarios, what we can clearly see when we think about the proportion of early successional forests, which is not good for caribou, is that we're encroaching, we're going from an, uh, a state where caribou are doing okay, they can, uh, they can maintain their populations uh, at that level of early successional forest, but then we're approaching the upper limit where they might become, uh, where the landscape's becoming unsuitable and potentially less self-sustaining on a population level for caribou at the 45% uh, benchmark that's set out by Environment Canada there. So we can think about this in terms of landscape su suitability for caribou, where perhaps down here we're more suitable, but up here we're m moving towards uh, less suitable habitat. What we can clearly see is that all three of these models uh, push caribou to a limit that's not desirable. Uh, and what this is telling us is that, well, what we need to be focusing on is not necessarily where to 
put conservation zones, but probably where we need to direct this harvest. And so with Dave Martell, uh, we're currently working on developing a harvest model that can maximize the amount of value that industry can get off that land while meeting caribou constraints across that landscape. The second take home message that I want you to get from this is when we look at all of those preferred um, caribou patches across that landscape for our caribou mosaic plan, but also that Mark's hand solution, when we run through the model through time, what you can clearly see is that the integrity of that network, especially in our caribou mosaic, at some point becomes compromised. Granted, there is a switch on, switch off for the caribou mosaic uh, plan, but that assumes that when we cut a given stand of forest, that in 60 years, all of a sudden, it can be good enough that caribou will prefer it. Uh, there's a lot of assumptions that are going into that, especially when we're talking about caribou preferring lichen as a resource. Whether or not that's actually going to pan out is sort of an open question at the moment. So caribou conservation planning approaches may not work out without better directing wood supply. So we're talking about where and how much can be harvested, um, giving caribou and industry constraints on that forest management unit. Secondly, incorporating caribou values into planning decisions leads to better habitat, caribou habitat configuration. That, those are the two main sort of take home points that I want you guys to run home with. Where we're moving towards is trying to model this in a dynamic fashion in that we're going to repeat this workflow every 10 years as you would in a given planning cycle for, for wood supply. We then, as I alluded to, want to focus on designing a harvest model that can meet industry needs but also works towards adhering to caribou constraints on that landscape. The third thing is caribou and climate change. I recently wrote a manuscript which we submitted uh, to Global Climate Change looking at how climate change may directly impact caribou in northern Ontario. What we found was that under all scenarios, caribou will likely uh, have a range recession throughout northern Ontario. That range recession is not as you might expect. It's going to occur across the northern areas and then uh, eastern areas of, of, of Ontario. And that's chiefly because the largest degree of warming that we're going to see in Ontario is going to be along the shores of, of Hudson Bay and James Bay there. What you can also see from these range of scenarios, so here's our best case scenario, this is our worst case scenario, so business as usual, 2050, 2070, is that under business as usual that we're going to have the most severe range collapse, but that, that the probability of persistence in this is, is highest within that southwest region. Meaning that if it's in that southwest region of northern Ontario, where we have uh, forest management units, that developing long-term wood supply plans that adhere to caribou constraints is going to be pretty vital for their long-term persistence, um, in, specifically in Ontario. We're moving towards also looking at these indirect impacts of climate change. So we're interested, uh, specifically Colin Daniel and, and Mike Watton in the Fire Lab at the University of Toronto, are interested in looking at how forest succession, so changes in forest succession might impact that landscape level um, canopy cover, which will subsequently impact how caribou use that landscape in the future. But then I think what's, what's the most interesting is when we talk about expected fire weather index, which is sort of like a, a danger index for, for fire, for, the, for those that aren't unaware, and in northwest Ontario is thought to maybe possibly double. Um, and this will obviously have a huge negative impact on woodland caribou throughout northwest Ontario.